Michael O'Dane wears a lot of hats, a lot of them. He's an art collector, housing expert, developer, social worker, philanthropist, and activist. Born in England, O'Dane spent time traveling the world. Now he's known for his work as a supporter of the arts and artists. He owns one of the most significant collections of Canadian artists in the country. But before all that, O'Dane could be considered a social justice warrior. Yeah, I'm interested to use the word social justice because um, that's a word that my, um, one of my grandsons uses. He's a um, hip hop dancer down in, um, in, uh, in Los Angeles, but he, um, he, he's very big on uh, social justice and he, um, he tells me about social justice <laughs> and I didn't know uh, really what the word uh, really um, meant till, uh, till recently, but no, I, I've been interested in, um, in public life. I've been interested in um, that for, um, since I was a teenager, I guess. So you actually joined the Freedom Riders. So I think we should start by explaining what the Freedom Riders were. Well, I, I got involved in, um, in the U.S. South in 1961. I, I was uh, not involved. I wasn't a member of any organization, um, but I, I was simply traveling from uh, Nashville, Tennessee to New Orleans and when the bus stopped um, at the um, uh, Greyhound station in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, I decided uh, for the meal break to um, join the people uh, on the uh, colored side of the, um, the bus station. They had two signs, white colored. And so I, I, I went in and um, sat at the counter and um, ordered some, uh, some fried chicken, which I thought must be a local delicacy. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then ended up uh, getting arrested because um, I, I insisted on um, uh, eating my meal on, on that side of the bus station. And then I met all these people in, uh, in the uh, city jail and later on the, um, the uh, state penitentiary who, who, who had, were uh, involved in the, the freedom rides. And so you end up making a statement by eating on the colored side of the restaurant. They said, well, uh, you know, I, you, you seem to be a foreigner and uh, we respect that. So uh, what we'll do, we'll uh, put you in a uh, patrol car and we'll catch that bus and we'll hold the bus um, uh, for you and we'll put you back on the bus. And, and uh, say goodbye to you. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. But first I, I, I had an order for fried chicken and I'm going back <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, Greyhound station to finish my supper. And uh, then they said, well, put that commie away. And uh, they had decided I was a, um, obviously um, uh, some sort of threat to the, um, the local um, establishment. So you did spend time in jail. Yes, the, the next morning I, I was taken before a Judge uh, Spencer and sentenced to um, four months definite and four months indefinite and a, um, it's a, a $250 fine. And you came back to Canada and started the BC Civil Liberties. Yes, uh, that, uh, that evolved. Uh, strangely enough, when I was a, um, the following summer, I was a prison guard at the um, Ocala um, prison, it was a summer job. That was a uh, BC um, provincial um, prison in, in Burnaby. And uh, um, of course, when um, for some reason, a local columnist, uh, Jack Wasserman, decided to put it in the paper that I'd been hired there, and then the uh, Attorney General Bonner ordered the warden to fire me immediately. Why did he want you fired? Well, because he felt it was quite inappropriate that I <laughs> I had been an inmate uh, the year before, and I was uh, working as a prison guard <laughs> the following summer. He wasn't fired, but he didn't stay either. Instead, he went off in search of himself, and he ended up at university. You eventually uh, got a degree in social work. Sort of a long-term plan was to be a social worker, and then um, I ended up uh, going to the um, London School of Economics to work on a doctorate, and uh, I, I decided to become a specialist in, um, in housing policy. 
So um, then, I, then I got a job in uh, Toronto with the Ontario Housing Corporation. And then I moved to Ottawa, uh, where I worked as a, um, ran a housing uh, program for the uh, Canadian Council on Social Development and, and uh, doing research and, um, and uh, being involved in, with citizen movements uh, for, for better housing across Canada. So isn't this interesting? You take your experience, which was with social justice, and then your university studying social work, maybe be a social worker, and you end up doing social research on housing. A field work placement I had uh, in the School of Social Work was actually in the McLean Park housing uh, project in, uh, in uh, the Strathcona area of Vancouver, and uh, I got very interested in that. I began to understand that the importance of, of good housing for, for, for people and, and uh, reasonably cost, cost housing and, and good, good housing and for, for families and children. And so I, I became, decided to follow the, up that interest. And, and then um, I guess it was around uh, 70, late 72, the, uh, my friend Dave Barrett became premier. And uh, one of the first things he did was to um, invite me to come back from Ottawa and he wanted me to become uh, Deputy Minister of Housing in Victoria. And so I, I went and told the Premier, I said, yeah, I'm happy to do the job, but I, I'd like to live in Vancouver. And uh, he told me bluntly, no, Deputy Ministers have to live in Victoria, but we'll pay you the same and we'll call you a special advisor. So that's what uh, I did for a while. And so you took your knowledge and experience with um, housing research and policy. How did you apply it to BC? What recommendations did you give? Well, I, I basically uh, had the opportunity to um, start the, um, the housing programs for the BC government because hardly anything was happening till I, till I got there. So uh, we ended up setting up a housing ministry and um, and, uh, and we, we got a lot of housing built in, in um, a very short period of time. We were able to get a lot of housing built, but we also uh, engaged in a lot of land development on the periphery of uh, Victoria and, um, and, and Vancouver, uh, working with municipalities to service land to, so that housing could be built. And, and it was a very uh, interesting time and a very active time for me. And I, I, uh, I enjoyed it uh, very much, and, and uh, because I had a good relationship with the Premier, um, I was able to, um, to get quite a bit of done, get a lot of uh, money for our, for our ministry. But then that, uh, I saw that was coming to an end, uh, and then so uh, I decided to check out, and instead of being uh, chucked out by the uh, uh, social new social credit government when it, under um, uh, Bill Bennett, I when you were with the Premier and working on housing, that was the golden age of social housing, really. A lot of social housing, co-op housing was being built. When you look at uh, the city or the province now, what's your assessment of where we are with housing and homelessness? The, the homeless situation is, um, is, is terrible. It, it, it's, uh, I, and I, don't, uh, I, I can't say I fully understand it. Uh, all I can tell you is that um, uh, us uh, greedy developers like uh, my company Polygon, uh, we, we would love to build a lot more housing, but uh, I think we, we have to turn down about nine out of every 10 uh, sites that we, uh, that we study. We, we, we just can't make the numbers work. What were those early days like for Polygon? You know, you, you start off, uh, pretty small, and, and then um, you, 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 you learn by hook or by crook how to um, build up a, a business. But um, I had never contemplated going into um, a business till I um, found myself unemployed in the um, late 70s. And um, I, 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 was, I considered different businesses, but I never considered uh, the housing business, because up till then, I'd, I, I, I took a fairly dim view of um, of uh, real estate and making money off real estate. I, I believed it should be a kind of a social uh, service, so to speak. Um, but I had uh, gradually um, found that in order to get a lot of housing built to, while I was with the provincial government, I ended up meeting some um, uh, developers, uh, particularly um, 
Most impressive, of course, was uh, Jack Poole of Day On Development uh, and uh, Elvin Nayrod uh, of his own company, Nayrod Development, uh, Norm Cressy, who's a, a big guy today. And, and I, I, I got to know these people as we started to do deals. And, I found they weren't so bad as what I, I thought. <laughs> I found they were pretty decent people who cared about the community. And uh, that was a surprise to me. So I, I started to shift my, um, my opinion. Fast forward almost 50 years over which he was building thousands of homes for people in British Columbia. All the while, a passion for the visual arts was just burning inside him. Obviously, one of the loves of your life is art. And that started at a very early age. Yes. Can you remember some of those early experiences when you saw a work of art and you went? I grew up in a, in a house that uh, had no art to speak of. Uh, we had a, a few pictures of uh, photographs, I should say, of um, uh, men playing polo and, um, and, and, um, uh, and uh, horses uh, and that sort of thing. But there, was, um, there wasn't a... Um, any, uh, any other art in, in, in our home. But um, at a very early age, I had the opportunity to go to the uh, Provincial Museum in Victoria. I went to Saturday uh, morning um, lectures there starting when I was 10. And so a lot of them were to do with um, nature. Sometimes they'd run a film. Sometimes it was uh, magic lantern slides, as we called them in those days. This is back in the um, 1940s. and. Uh, and afterwards, I, I would have the opportunity to uh, wander through the, um, the, the exhibition, the stacks, so to speak, where they had all these uh, marvelous things in um, glass cases, and they had old totems around and all the rest. And I, I, that was the exposure I had was to the art of the Northwest Coast. And that was what I, I, I just attract, I had an attraction, an actual attraction at that age. I didn't understand it, but it, uh, the, the, actually, the, um, the uh, director of the museum, Dr. Clifford Car Carl, he, he noticed my uh, hanging around there. And he, he, um, one day he came with some white gloves and he, he said, uh, he asked me my name. He says, uh, would you like to see some of these um, objects uh, up close? And he said, put on these gloves. And he opened a, one of the uh, glass display cases. and let me handle uh, two or three masks and showed me, you know, how they'd be, or the, how you could tell that they'd been danced in the past through the marking, you know, the, the, well, through looking at the back. And then he started to explain the iconography and, and explaining the relationship of the art to the, uh, the natural world in, in, um, of the West Coast. And, and, and that, that stayed with me. At the age of 14, you got on a bus and went down to Mexico to look at some art? So I know I used the, um, the, uh, er, my summer earnings to go to Mexico to, uh, to look at the, uh, I, was, I was fascinated with the murals in, in, in Mexico City and, um, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the um, artists, the, uh, the, what they call the Mexican modernists and um, uh, Diego Rivera, um, David Sequeiros and uh, Jose Clemente Orozco. They, they call them La, Las Tres Grandes, the, the three big ones. And, and I was fascinated. I'd, I'd, I, I encountered their work, uh, taking a book out of the Victoria Public Library. And, and uh, I was interested in their work primarily because they, they all had an association with um, the Mexican Revolution and uh, they had a commitment to uh, to social justice. Over the years, Michael's passion for art kept growing. He just couldn't pass up a piece that spoke to him. Piece by piece, his collection grew beyond his ability to house it. So he built a museum. We're sitting in the O'Dain Art Museum. You have donated much of your collection to the works that we see here. Why did you choose Whistler? Well, uh... A lot of the art created in, in uh, British Columbia, and of course people have been creating art here for thousands of years, a lot of it relates to the landscape. So uh, 
When we were looking for a um, site for a museum, we, we looked at various ones and people, some people were very kind in offering us possibilities, but uh, we decided we, we wanted to do something um, in, a, in an actual landscape surrounded by trees. And, and uh, so that some way the art could re relate to the, the, the landscape. You've been involved with various art galleries, um, certainly the National Gallery, Vancouver Art Gallery. How do you see uh, the future for the Vancouver Art Gallery? I, I, I believe that um, the Vancouver Art Gallery um, uh, can only have a, a good future if it, uh, if it uh, moves into a new quarters. Um, I, I intensely dislike the uh, Rattenbury building. It's, it's not a building that really uh, suits uh, art in, in many ways. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things you should know is that, that the building is not held in high regard by the indigenous people of British Columbia. After all, that's where so-called justice was served. That's where so many um, uh, First Nations people uh, were, met uh, uh, the Canadian justice. They were sent to long prison terms in, in, uh, in quite a number of cases. They were um, sentenced to death in, in that building. And, uh, and uh, it doesn't have a good feeling for, for many people. It certainly doesn't have a good feeling for me. You are so generous with, with your time, but also um, with financial help. If you look in Wikipedia, I think there's a complete page of just group, artist group after group after group after group that you have supported over the years. I mean, it's been outstanding, your support for the arts. And your most, um, your most recent donation was to St. Paul's Hospital. And it's specifically for indigenous art within the hospital. Talk to me about that. Well, that was a, a great idea. They, they came to me and said, would we help out with their public art program? And um, they said, you can help uh, by, by looking after our, our, our visual art uh, program. So that was a wonderful opportunity. And that's, that's what we're doing. And you make the statement that for someone who's in hospital, who perhaps is indigenous, to see some work that they feel comfortable with and recognize will help with their healing. That's what uh, I've been told by um, uh, a lot of um, First Nations friends, you know, and, and uh, they, 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 want, they, they, they look for, for a hospitable environment and, and uh, they are very, very influenced. They are, they are closer, I, I don't want to romanticize it, but they, uh, many of them are closer to, to uh, nature and the, the the, the creatures that we, we share our province with and most of our city dwellers. So. Um, Michael, do you have um, some values or a motto that you live by? I, I, not generally uh, speaking. I, I, I don't think it's, um, uh, I'm very good at uh, imparting uh, wisdom. Uh, uh, I think that's at least what my, my children would tell you. <laughs> but. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, there is a, um, a saying of um, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, that that, that I, um, I, I I I sometimes uh, think about, uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, that one should uh, live as if one were to uh, to die tomorrow, but to learn as if one was to live forever. So. That's <laughs> Do you ever look back and say, this is a life well lived? No, I, I, I don't really. I, 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 I look back and I say, I'm extremely fortunate um, uh, uh, the, my, my life. And, and um, I, um, yes, there are things I, I regret uh, uh, very much. But uh, on the whole, I, I'm very fortunate. And um, I had a very um, unhappy childhood. Uh, and uh, and actually went beyond my. I guess most a lot of teenagers are unhappy, so I was an unhappy teenager. But that continued on into my early twenties and um, didn't change until I was into my um, uh, almost my mid twenties, and 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 then um, things changed and opened up for me. But I I was really lost in um, many many respects in um, as a, a child and. Um, 
and uh, and uh, so um, uh, since then, though, um, on the whole, I, I've had a uh, remarkably um, happy life, and, and I've been very thankful for the people that um, I've been associated with. My my two wives, and uh, my, Yoshi wouldn't mind me mentioning my my first wife because she quite often comes over for dinner, and, and uh, we we still have a um, a, a relationship and and. Um, and uh, of course, uh, a wonderful family, and um, and extremely important to me is my my wonderful business partners, because um, as I'm sure, when you talk to other business people, they they'll say, you know, what was your secret to success? And uh, in many cases, they'll they'll they will give credit to the the, the wonderful teams that they. Um, they, they work, had the privilege to work together with, and that's certainly, in, in my case, that's true. <laughs> At 83 years of age, Michael O'Dane has a lot of stories from his many careers, all with a theme of social justice throughout. Michael O'Dane, one of BC's legends.